What's up, everybody? It's Danny Brown with The Deal. This week's interview is remarkable. Dr. Sherry Yafai has joined us. She's not any doctor. She is the cannabis and emergency medicine physician at St. John's Medical Center. She started her career at UCSD. She graduated medical school, taught for class 2005, got her medical residency in emergency medicine in 2009. Well-versed doctor on many levels. She started a cannabis clinic called Relief Institute, R-E-L-E-A-F, and she's leading the charge in trying to push medicinal benefits and uses of cannabis uh, into the mainstream medical industry. She's getting a lot of pushback for political reasons, et cetera, as we all know, but we got to help her push it over the top. She's having a, um, overseeing a huge seminar October 5th, which she will mention in her interview, but this is legit. There's things to help people in pain. There's things to help children. There's there's uses to help anxiety. There's all sorts of legitimate medical uses and to hold this back from the population at large is really criminal in itself. So well, listen and learn. This is a wonderful, wonderful conversation with Dr. Sherry. Everyone's here today. We have a big crowd. Welcome back to Danny Brown, The Deal. We have a special guest today, Dr. Sherry, a good friend of mine and a foremost expert on medicinal cannabis and other medical topics. So rather than getting into your background right away, why don't we just get down and dirty and like, let's start this. Like why in 2019 in free Western world are we still having a conversation about cannabis and it's not why is it not mainstream everywhere legal medicinal if it's scientifically proven what the heck is going on thanks that's a great question so thank you for having me on today this is a really exciting day and an exciting for time joining here us. in way too hot southern california but um here in southern california we're really progressive just in general right we know we're progressive we know we're probably a more mixed community than most areas. The problem with cannabis becomes, you know, we're talking about about 80 years worth of political, social brainwashing. I mean, for a lack of better words. So since the 1920s, I'm going to go back in time right now. Yeah. Actually, let's go pre-1920. I'm going to go way back. So pre-1920s, we actually used cannabis in medical supplies. So we really? have uh, Eli Lilly had a medical cannabis tincture that was mixed along with morphine and uh, chloroform. So, you know, back where we were back then. So we've the good, come a long way. They had way. the good stuff, had the good stuff back in the 1900s. But they, got we, a cold? Here's yeah, some more food. We didn't have antibiotics yet. We didn't have insulin yet. So we were really using, you know, things that we could get our hands on, which were things from the plant. And prior to 1920s, that's really where our our sophistication was, was on a medical level. Okay. Then you get to the 1920s and immigration from Mexico. And then you get black immigration. As, I shouldn't use the word immigration, but we see a lot of black jazz in the South mm -hmm. starting up. And we see a lot more cannabis use in both those two populations. And of course, we know these are the two populations that tend to be more oppressed and tend to be more mm, uh, racially profiled against in general. So in yeah. the 1920s, what happened was Mexican immigrants brought in marijuana. Hence the term marijuana. It yeah. is not science. Marijuana is Mexican slang for pot, right? For yeah. cannabis, for anything that you think of as can, a cannabinoid based medication. Yeah. And what a they motto, did. Right, right the exactly. Motto. So there was, and I was I was actually just showing this to. Ray knows about the motto. The, we were just looking this up the other day. And if you look and you know the La Cucaracha song, I don't know if anybody knows it. I know I, the song. Okay. Say that to me. So what do you know all of the words that include the marijuana part? No. Okay, so it's like, keep going. What was the part, you know? They would block that. So uh, one of my Mexican friends brought it up to me a few years back when I first started getting into this. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, la cucaracha, la cucaracha. Ya no puedes caminar, cannot walk. Porque no se fumas, porque no se fumas la marijuana. So it's part and parcel serious? because it was part of the culture. And Does so they real know that. The, we'll ask them. 
We'll ask them. <laughs> so it was part of the culture, and that's what part of the culture that they brought up north into the states, and that's what they started taking and saying, well, that's what we need to start imprisoning and export, right? Exporting people back home or deporting people back home was because we, we'd want to prevent them from bringing in this negative new drug. It wasn't new. It wasn't a new drug. It was a new form and a new slang term. That's really where we're seeing the big difference. And then if you look into the DEA records, and so the way it's written into DEA law is not as cannabis, the way every single one of our other drugs and medications are written as, it's written in as marijuana. Yeah. And that's really where it starts to get interesting. So in the 1920s, things change, and we get reefer madness. We get yes. all of this social, political angst and you know if you smoke pot you're gonna go kill someone you're gonna be outrageous you're gonna be um i think the the movie reefer madness actually had everyone die in the end oh my yeah so we, yeah, that's right so it was it was ingrained in our society so what, what years are we talking about for reefer madness? reefer madness was the 60s 60s right 1960s right so it's so that's it, much later on. Much later. So it carried, 60s. right. So 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it carries on until the 70s. And the 70s, all of a sudden, people are all free love. Let's The Vietnam War sure. is going on. People are trying to break culture against government changed. and culture. And so they all start smoking pot because that's a way to say, give the, you know, give your middle yeah. finger to the government and everything that's going on and you disagree with. Yeah. Guess what we didn't see during that time period? We didn't see huge spikes in lung cancer. We did not see huge spikes in overdose-related deaths like we're seeing now in the opiate crisis. We yeah. did not see huge spikes in a lot of medical illnesses, right? Despite having a whole culture and a whole group of people yeah. for a whole decade using flour-based, you know, smokable products. Yeah. And, and don't get me huh? wrong, I'm not saying that this is the be-all, end-all, this is the the bees knees, um, you know, everybody needs to go back to smoke and pot. But what I'm saying is, is that's where the cultural revolution led us. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of quieted in the 1980s because of Nancy Reagan's dare to do so drugs, no. just say no. I mean, we all grew up with this. It was like plastered on every good parents, you know, bumper sticker and every school had a program and it wasn't really effective. But what was effective was this is a drug. Right. That was what was effective. Lumping cannabis and cannabis products in as a drug yeah. akin to heroin. And then we fast forward to 1996. So in 1996, what happened to get Compassionate Use Act or um, Prop 215 here in California? Does anybody know? Mm -hmm. We have a crowd. Huh? I smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> so what's the answer? We. <laughs> But why? Why 96? Like what happened in 1996? That's his answer. I smoke a lot of weed. To everything. Right. I smoke a lot of weed. Just keep asking him questions. Right. I smoke no, so, a lot of weed. So that's like, that was what got to me recently. I was like, what happened in 96 that all of a sudden changed things? Because we're dealing. The whole, the whole middle of the whole crack thing, though, when they, when they were funding Nicaragua by selling cocaine here in the U.S. and bringing it in. Yes, right but around the, same time. around the same time. But so why didn't it legalize everywhere? Right. Why in California? What happened in California in the 90s? The AIDS epidemic. The AIDS epidemic hit San Francisco so hard in the okay. 80s and the 90s that we all of a sudden had to have, we start seeing these buyer's clubs pop up in San Francisco. And these buyer's clubs were all about selling AZT and AIDS medications, one, and two was pot. Right, hmm. cannabis. They were selling cannabis and allowing people to have a safe place to go smoke pot to deal with their pain. AIDS related pain and Ugh. neuropathy and anorexia, and not being able to eat, and they were suffering. It and so, sense. what happened was in the 90s, they pushed forward this new medical marijuana use, and it's called the Compassionate Act use. So the Compassionate Use Act. That was California. That was California. So, that was so we started. That was it. the first flag in the ground we were the first flag in the ground and of course every physician you know myself included quite frankly turned turned our backs and said well whatever it's for you know that that people right it's not for everyone and this is not good for everyone so we kind of turned a blind eye that was 96 and continued for a long time and then all of a sudden around 2010 Again, we see a new change in its recreational legalization in Colorado and Washington. So what happened? 
So that was 2010. 2010, yeah, 2012, so yeah. Another, years, right. That's years. right. So what happens 15 years later to now cause recreational use? Anyone? Don't give me the same answer. Uh, <laughs> he smokes a lot of weed. <laughs> that's actually the, that's the answer. No. So taxes is one question, but no. Actually, Charlotte Figgy, a little, little girl, has this severe seizure disorder where she's having 200 to 400 wow. seizures a day. And her mom is beyond herself. Her husband is a military, um, is in the military and is overseas and is, you know, sending videos to her husband of like how many seizures her daughter's having. She tries every single medication out there, pharmaceutical companies, everything. She's gone far and wide. She finds out online maybe CBD can be helpful for seizures. She tries using CBD oils for her little daughter. And lo and behold, it works. And her seizures, you know, pared down to nothing. Wow. Okay. And so now she has a normal twin sister. And now she's all of a sudden growing and catching up to her twin sister. And you cannot deny these facts, right? You cannot deny. Yeah. It's pure, pure science. Pure science, right? Like, and you cannot deny that she's not getting high. She's growing. It's good for her brain because she's not seizing, right? So let's be clear. It's not good for her brain because it's helping her nerves grow it's good for her brain because she's not seizing and she's treating it just like she would with any other medication yeah. right more benefit than negative by far absolutely by far by far outweighing and this it. is how would someone like that how would she be taking it as an oil tincture so in, she's like, taking it in, in her mouth, mouth an oil drop a couple of times a day and That's she gets to like return to life so that one case study Broke open the dam, so That's to speak. right. So she, her mom was really loud about it and thankful. Thank thankful God. to, every, you know, really thank God that she was loud and, and made, you know, made a splash on social media and that took off. And so parents actually started moving to Colorado because they were trying to get treatment for their kids. And so Colorado and Washington opened the gates and then it's a domino effect. It's literally a domino effect right now. It's, I believe by last count, it's 33 states in, in the US that are medically legal and about 10 plus the District of Columbia that is recreationally legal. So you're talking about the overwhelming majority of states have medical legal rules. And now as of January, 2019, we have the new federal hemp farm bill that has passed allowing for hemp based CBD in all 50 states. So you, you take a look and you're like, oh, this is, this is not what I thought. Like it is actually more places than not okay. in more, more, well, that's good. more access than any other time in the history of the world. You can order hemp CBD based medications online anywhere you live, even Texas, because Texas tends to be one of our you know, more conservative states. And then you go one step further and you say, guess what? Erwan sells this stuff. Bed Bath and Beyond sells this stuff. Neiman Marcus sells this yeah, stuff. Mainstream is not gets. Barney's because they're going down. No, I'm teasing. We're here in Beverly Hills. Yeah, I figured I should. Poor Barney's. <laughs> That's <laughs> staying open. That one is open. Oh, it's staying open. Yeah, I think they're one they're of the flagship, few. right? Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. So, when you're talking CBD, it, it for the most part, and I don't, I may be wrong. Is it CBD? that's being used for medicinal purposes versus THC? So a and, lot of people like to kind of, different? yeah. A lot of people like to kind of separate the two out and kind of give THC like the evil twin sister and mm -hmm. the, and CBD be like, you know, the angel brother of it all. And I do brother sister because cannabis tends to be more female based because it's a flowering plant and hemp tends to be more male based because we're growing it for its stock and its yeah. fiber and its, I like and its it. strength. So it's, it's male female to me a little bit. Um, and so you think about it like one is the evil twin. It's not. THC has a lot of usages and it's not all for recreational purposes. It's just knowing what you're using for. Like I, I you know, people are like, so what should I take? And I'm like, well, what's your, what's your diagnosis? What's the problem? And they're like, well, you know, what if I just want to take something? I'm like, well, I'm a doctor. I don't just say like, you know, take an Orco because you feel like it. Like yeah. that seems silly to me or, you know, yeah. That's exactly right. It was Xanax Wednesday. We're going to start having it here in the office. No, right. I'm saying. After, after Cannabis Fridays, we'll have Xanax Wednesday. Right. <laughs> so, Wonderful. Right. Robert Refkin will love that. Right. Perfect. So, <laughs> so we'll start changing. But the point is, is no, like that's not the intention, right? And the intention is always, you know, this isn't a vitamin. I tell people all the time, like, don't, you know, 
we actually had a new rule set into place here in Los Angeles where you can't make these products look like children's foods because for a long time you had like um, cannabis toast crunch or you could get mm, <laughs> see an eyeball <laughs> rave. You could, you know, a lot of them were in gummy bears. That was kind of a classic. Yeah. You cannot make it look like a gummy bear anymore. It has to be a simple square or rectangle object. It has to be labeled appropriately because what we were having problems with were kids getting into this stuff because mom and dad or grandma or grandpa left it around or a friend brought it over and they, you know, took a gummy bear out and ate it. And, you know, as every kid should eat a gummy bear, that's fine. But it shouldn't be something that's laced with a yeah. medication or a drug. Right? Sure. So we were seeing a lot of pediatric overdoses that were landing in the emergency department. And that's something that I'm really sensitive to. Of course, we both have kids. Yeah. And we, we want to keep them safe. I mean, yeah, at absolutely. the end of the day, Charlotte Figgy had a disease that was really severe. And there was an, a reason and intention for taking this medication. Every kid doesn't need it. And this is like, so, it's, it's so near and dear to my heart because people are like, when I first started getting into this space, people were like, well, would you rather your daughter smoke pot at a, at a college party or drink alcohol? And I was like, number one, if she's going to do either, she needs to learn how to be safe, how to be getting her own either medication or pot or alcohol and not getting it from a stranger because that we know is going to be a risky. bigger problem and riskier. Exactly, we don't know what it is. So educating my daughter about what you use, how you get it, and when it's appropriate. Yeah, you still can't get in a car or do anything still else that that's you should, right. it's the same. We still can use Uber and Lyft, and we can still go down those pathways of yeah. talking about sober drivers, and it's not about what you use, it's about safety. About and it's about understanding that there's you know limitations to everything, and that, yeah, you wanna experiment with some things, we can understand that. We've all been through that at some point, but doing it in a safe yeah. way where you, you feel good. So I want to interject here for those here and listening. You're not just talking because uh, we're promoting a Cheech and Chong lifestyle. So you have a degree in neuroscience, magna cum laude from UCLA. You have a doctorate in medicine from University of California, San Diego. You were an ER doctor uh, for many years. You, you've been in the medical doctorate at a high, high level your whole career. So I just wanted to make sure uh, that people realize that. That said, there's so many topics to go on. Let's start with, since we were talking about the children, and I think that's really relevant, what are some proven uh, effective medicinal uses for uh, children that have issues. Uh, clearly, it sounds like right. seizures is one. I mean, if as a parent, if there's something that I could do for my kid, I want to know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk to like some of the big things that are helping children now. Good, good, great, great question. So number one, in general, you know, we don't recommend cannabis-based products for a young, healthy brain under the age of 21, even to up to 25, really, as this being the time where your brain is still growing. So first and foremost, so the, I always preface things with this is not a recreational talk. Yeah. I'm not talking to the teenagers who wanna Just go out there and party. smoke and yeah. party. Right, that's not what this is all so about. So don't do it till you're 25. Right. If you're healthy and <laughs> don't you're, have medical health, reason right, exactly. to do it. That's exactly right. Um, so, so young kids, so where are kids in my practice coming from? I have a handful of two year olds with brain tumors. So if you have cancer, if your child has cancer, this is a number one for 23 years here in the state of California. We have approved this for cancer usage as a cancer adjunct for chemotherapy because of its benefit for nausea and vomiting, because of its benefit for appetite, and because of its benefit for pain. So that, you know, it's really sad to talk about pediatric cancers because of course it's, it's terrible. Pediatric anything. Right. It's, it's really hard, but this is where, you know, we can do things like avoid, you know, I have um, one of my kids is um, undergoing chemotherapy and typically it basically burns your mouth up. So oh. you get this thing called mucositis and it's really hard to eat and drink and swallow. And so they end up getting a tube put down their nose into their stomachs or even a tube outside their stomachs to wow. feed them or hydrate them. And one of the things that we're seeing is is a decrease in that aspect. So if you if you can use a cannabis-based product on a daily basis, and again, usually these are oil tinctures for kids that we're using. They're not, I'm not telling your two-year-old to vape. Yeah. Um, that's not what we're doing. We're using an oil tincture that doesn't necessarily get them high. That's not the goal. The goal is to get them to be pain modified and to get them comfortable. 
um, when they're going through something that's terrible. So we can avoid sometimes getting to this point where their mouth is so s filled with sores that yeah. they actually have to get a tube put in their nose. So instead, they are, they are able to continue to drink and eat and hydrate through their chemo treatments. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of which, so I tell this to everyone, do not stop your chemo, radiation, cancer treatments through your regular doctor just because you heard pot save someone's life. It's great. That was one person. I'm so happy. I look forward to the day when we get cannabis as a routine part of our treatment. But until that day, keep going with what your doctor recommends. You can use this as an adjunct or a supplement or an addition to what you're already using. Yeah. And that's where you're going to get the best results is when okay. you use them that's together. Good. That's very good. Yeah. Um, so and then in other kind of less grave pediatric terms. So seizures, the FDA and DEA both um, regulated and have descheduled a drug called Epidiolex, which is a CBD based, CBD plant based version of, of uh, cannabis. No, uh, sorry, it's a it's a cannabis hemp type product, and they did this because they figured out, hey, it worked for Charlotte Figgy. Let's take it to the farm, right? Or take it to the pharmaceutical rather than yeah. the farm, I should say. Big pharma. Right, big pharma, and so they've taken that opportunity and they've run with it. And you know, kudos because it's giving it more recognition and helping more people. And Amazing. so seizures is one. Um, UCSD is doing a study on autism and ADHD with CBD and kids. That's going to be another new avenue that's that we see. That's a newer development. That's a newer development. It's still something that's kind of being evaluated, but it's something that we can consider now instead of things like Adderall and Ritalin, which are, you know, what is, do you know what the regular street drug equivalent of Adderall and Ritalin is? I thought that's. Meth, right. Oh, really? So, you know, it's, and I've had mo like a mom come at me once because she's like, it works for me. And, you know, I can't believe you're saying it's equal to meth. And I said, you know what? It's okay that it works for you, and all medications that are out there and approved may work for some people. The point is, is that you gotta figure out what's right for you. And the goal is, is not to take people off of what's working for them, the goal is to have options. And to give people not just one narrow path, but to give them multiple paths. And figure it out. You know, I've had a patient came into my office this past week, and she's got postpartum depression, and we've been talking a lot. And one of the issues was, you know, she was on a pharmaceutical medication. It was really working for her, but she didn't like the idea of the side effects. And so she came off of it. And I said, you know what? Everything you take, be it a plant, a drug, a medication, is going to have a side effect. And the best thing that we can do is say, if it's working well for you and the side effects are n little to none, keep going with it. Right. Weigh the pros Weigh, and cons. Exactly. Nothing's perfect. That's exactly right. Like this, life. That's exactly <laughs> right. And I think that's the hard part for a lot of people to get. They like want black and white. This is bad or it's good. And life it, is all in the gray. It's, it's, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Life and real estate. Yeah. Well, Compass real by estate. Danny Brown. Yeah. <laughs> real estate is real estate is dark. It's right. not gray. No, it's <laughs> so I gotta think if those uses are beneficial for children i mean we're humans as mm -hmm. adults those pain management i assume anxiety and depression what, what would be some good uses that are proven for adults so for adults kind of strictly by um the medical board of california's rules and regulations so we're looking at cancer treatment hiv and aids treatment you're looking at nausea and vomiting inflammatory bowel disease so that includes things like crohn's and colitis which is really interesting because that's a, that's a really hard treatment as well. Not everybody does well with typical pharmaceuticals. Some people are Amazing. using this as an adjunct. Um, other things, uh, so, and then you get into other illnesses. So like epilepsy that we've been talking about. But in general, I find that there's actually three other things that we don't really talk about. So one of them is opiate reduction. That's huge. Huge. With people dying every day. Right. And and this Dad, is where we talk about pitcher just died a Santa Monica local legend. I mean, that's it's so every day sad every day. Everyone's been touched by it. And it doesn't have to be something where you're a heroin addict anymore. Like that's not what we're talking about anymore. There was a study that came out recently where you're more likely to die of an opiate death if you take any prescription opiates even than getting into a car accident. Like that's what level we're at. Like, like it's the most that's their most likely. Yeah, Death. it's, you know, if you're in your 30s and above and you take a painkiller oh for any reason, like you're you're probably going to die of an opiate death. Like that's how sad it's gotten. I mean, not to paint that's a very nuts. bleak picture, but <laughs> you're going to die what? You're gonna, I mean, you can you might 
death by opiate overdose it may be in your future yeah in our future right so i mean it's again and not to paint a bleak picture but that's, that's where we're reality. at and the problem becomes you know we've got things like methadone and suboxone buprenorphine we've got some solutions kind of that have been around i mean this is not new methadone is not new yeah it's hard Getting into a methadone clinic is challenging. You have to go every day to get your pill. You have to, you know, it consumes your life. Getting off of prescription painkillers is hard. It's not easy. Most of my patients are over 50 trying to get off of prescription painkillers. And these are, you know, mom and pop kind of people. Yeah. Had I'd, a bad back or knee surgery that's exactly or right. this or that. My, one, of, one of my first patients started out with a bad back 20 years ago. He's turning 70. 20 years ago from work and went on prescription painkillers and hit. Never come off. So, I mean, and when we talk about prescription painkillers, most people don't know what we're talking about in terms of how much. This gentleman was on about 150 Percocet, no, sorry, Oxy a day and 180 of Percocet a day. Pills? Pills? Pills. What? Milligrams, sorry, 150 milligrams oh. of Oxy. And so that is- What does that mean? So, What's sorry, a pill? So number of pills, so about, you're looking at about, uh, about 18 pills a day. Is about what you 18 of each they baby steps 36 or total, nine and 18 nine. total 18. No, it wasn't about efficacy because it works for a short period of time, and then what happens is you the need more, the pain comes back. So, you do build a tolerance, and then we get into things like you start to withdraw a little bit before your next dose is due. So, then yeah. we up the dosage, and, and, it's just a cycle. and it just kind of cycles. That's yeah. exactly right. Like it's not a treatment, any... right? It's just a band aid. And unfortunately, it's the kind of band aid like my kids use, where it's like it washes off after two seconds, and you need like another four of them on top. So, it's it's really been a challenge and the problem is is we don't have great options there was another study that came out that said you know we've swung the pendulum so far into like opiates are terrible don't prescribe any that now patients are not getting their prescriptions and they're miserable and they are in pain and they are suffering and and exactly and we haven't figured out that hey you have to work with them to bridge you got to work with people to bridge. You can't just say, oh, sorry, you have filled up too many prescriptions this year, so therefore we're cutting you off. Yeah. Like that's the way people go to the black web and the dark market mm -hmm. and get there. And then their, you're really risky because then who knows what someone's mixing in a lab in China and who knows what. That's right. And selling to you over the web. Yeah. And so that's, you know, we had, so I always talk about this as this being a potential bridge to gap that process, to get people to a lower dosage, because we know that these two do work together. And we do know that there's that we do need to modify this. And that's where the medical aspect of it comes in. Most of my patients are on anywhere from five to 10 pills a day. And it doesn't have to be on narcotics. It could be Synthroid for their thyroid. It could be a blood pressure medication. It could be a diabetic medication. But all of these play into one another, right? So, yeah. you know, people who are on chronic opiates have severe constipation so then we see you know they're on another two laxatives a day because they're so constipated so now we have to you know and then what happens is as you turn down the opiates all of a sudden you can turn down the laxatives and all of a sudden you can turn down some of the diabetic medications because they're walking more because yeah. they're not in as much pain and we know it's not cannabis curing diabetes because i know that's going around as well it's about being able to get up and move because we know exercise is helpful for your blood sugars yeah. So, so let's kind of, let's move that conversation in yeah. the right direction. So it's not about, hey, you're cured. You right. It's about, wow, this can free you up to do things like moving and this, things that we know are going to help you heal your natural body healing process. That's right. So the question about pain medication, is it dangerous to take up one pill? I mean, when, when you no. hear about it, it's going to kill us. Like when you get, I've had knee surgery, I've had rotator cuff, I've yeah. had neck so, no, I mean, is that a risk to take no, a pill? No, it's not. The problem because, so I know, I mean, we, and I always tell people, I'm like, life comes with speed bumps. I mean, it's just, you're just one kidney stone away from a Percocet. That's all you are. You're one kidney stone yeah. away. And come on. I, I've been in the ER for so long. So it's not the take it once or twice. It's the, the fact that it's addicting it's, and you could get to a level that's just rolling the dice. Right. And Russian so the roulette. point is, is that, you know, and especially with a lot of orthopedic surgeries, they're really painful. Kidney stones, really painful. There are really painful 
situations that people do need narcotics for and there are purposes for them and they're they they're appropriate and they're good for those situations the problem becomes once you know you had your spine surgery and you're written for three months of painkillers and you ha aren't really talked about yeah. how to come off of those yeah, and how to wean off the of high those. risk yeah. that's really where we're getting into the tougher spots you know like when you're danny you know, young 30 um Young 30. <laughs> Teasing. <laughs> and your young 30s and you're getting your shoulder repaired, you're, you're probably a little bit more apt to come off painkillers a little bit faster. Um, my husband would kill me, but if you're, it's going to cause you constipation and that irritates you, then that's also going to come off faster. But if you're older and your bowels already are a little bit slower and, you know, it's really helping you with the pain, then maybe you're not so quick to come off. And maybe you're not so, because your pain, yeah. your pain's going to last longer too, because you're not healing as fast as you used to. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the, it's these kind of, yeah. so what we went nuances. back to, the grays, right? The grays yeah. of life. Yeah. And, and it's hard because... And I feel bad for my physician colleagues a lot these days because you know, a lot of them talk about how they have to see 40 patients in an eight hour day. I mean, you, you can't have a, a long conversation about how to wean off your opiates after your post-op hip repair in a 15 minute conversation. Yeah. You just can't do it. It's not their fault and it's not the patient's fault. It's the system. So it's, it's this, the it's this kind of system process and understanding that, you know, it's, it's a lot of gray. <laughs> Is anxiety and depression a common thing? Because it seems like, you know, I know plenty of people that are right. are definitely smoking because they have anxiety and depression. It's sort of been their medication their right. whole life. So for some anxiety and medication, uh, anxiety and depression, I should say, are both really common indications for use. And what I like to talk to you about is, is this situational anxiety or depression? Or is this a chronic ongoing problem? Is right. this a postpartum? Do we need to take a second look at your hormones? Do we need to take a look at who you're smoking or vaping in front of? Do we need to take a look at how you are or are not avoiding regular prescription medications? You know, one of the things we were talking about before the podcast started was sex. And what we don't talk about with anxiety and depression is a lot of prescription medications affect your sexual desires and your libido and you don't wanna have sex anymore. So guess what? When you're in 20s and your 30s, it's a big deal. Not to say that for everybody else it's not either, but in your 20s and 30s, people stop using their prescription medications, even though it was helping, because their they sex life stops. Yeah. And because that's an important part of our personal relationships, and it's a part of that discussion. And so, you know, if your sex life is going to stop, then why would you take something that's going to make you feel better but not want to have sex? So one of the things that we see in terms of cannabis, and really specifically with THC, that it's really good for people's sex life. <laughs> and THC. T this is this is that evil stepsister, right? The evil twin yeah. sister. Now it's, we're getting somewhere. That, that's Let's, right. We're getting to the good stuff. So that's pay where, attention, guys. <laughs> especially if you're not teasing. Um, so, so that's where <laughs> that's where we see. And the best part, I actually think, is this is the first time that we're talking about sex for women. So we have a lot of products out there in the pharmaceutical world, Viagra for men. Yeah. We don't have any for women. And guess what? You're actually not technically supposed to prescribe Viagra for women because it hasn't been tested on women. Because women's sexual drive is not, or sexual capacity or orgasms are not a part of the medical conversation. Oh, God. Right? Another. Right. And, uh, right. Another. And like we see this kind of popping up. That That's right. The term hysteria, right? all of these things. And I think um, John Oliver did a segment the other night about how um, you would go to the doctor's office and one of the treatments for hysteria was to have sex with the doctor. Um, what a good, that's a great practice. Right, <laughs> right, exactly, that's right. So then remove your ovaries and go into menopause. Oh, what a job that right. guy had. Right, exactly. like, and like there are so many conversations to be had around that. <laughs> So many, so we can. Oh, we'll do a whole other podcast on that one. And he screens his patients for who he can treat and who right. he can't treat because he can only see forty a day. Right, that's right. <laughs> and then he goes out like so after sixties. It's he's good retiring. for sex, is what you're saying. Right, so it's good, and it's good for female sex and Females. female libido just as much as it is for men. And one of the th ways that the industry is actually getting into this is that they are designing things specifically for female sex. And one of the ways we were talking about was they, they have a spray now that you can spray directly on your clitoral area to improve and enhance your sexual orgasm for women. And one is, you know, something another person brought up to me was, 
well, do you have to disclose this to your partner? He said, of course you do. Otherwise, you're going to be dosing them. It would be like giving a Mickey, right? Giving something in some a woman's drink. You have to do the same. You know, we got to be kind to our partner. Wait a minute. It impacts the man? The guy will get it in his system as well. So if your spouse, partner, boyfriend, girlfriend. Oh, you'll get, what, they'll get high a little bit. Well, th even if they don't get high, let's say they're going to get a drug test at their work. Oh. All of a sudden, oh, they hello. test positive. <laughs> right. Contact high. It's contact, and it's not Second just contact. Smoke. It's mucosal contact, which makes it even stronger. Wow. Can you imagine that poor son of a bitch? Or, or let's say or he's. He or she is engaging in oral test. sex. Yeah, you know. The guy and crushes it, and then the next day he's uh, going to the police department job, and he gets drug tested. And they're like, uh, buddy, you're out. He's right. like, what? I'm the squarest guy. I've never taken a That's drug right. in my life. It's like there was a reason why sex was great last night. But That's brutal. That's the reason. Good to know. But but that's what I'm saying. So it's, you know, it's just like you want to be honest and open. And if you cannot engage in those types of sexual behaviors with people that you cannot be honest and open yeah. with, let's just, right, why are you having sex with them? That's Don't amazing. That's good to know. I'm going to keep that. So, good for sex. Lee's on? They're, they're working lubes. on more lubes now. <laughs> and the you major travel. lube corporations are coming up with versions of this. Um, I've been asked about those as well. And they're, listen, where people can turn a buck, they're going to try and turn a buck. Yeah. So it's important to know when it's going to be helpful and when it's not going to be helpful. And so it's, That's but, cool. to, but timing matters. We haven't really talked about this, but like oh. how much yeah, time do you have us. to wait for things to kick in? Yeah. So I tell everybody the same thing. If you're a first time user, smoke it. Yes. Don't try it any other way. Yeah. Just okay. smoke it. And we were talking about this earlier. There's um, an epidemic of illegal vape pens that yes. are going around the country right now where um, who knows what is being put into these oils, but it seems to be the overwhelming majority as of right now is on the illicit market. So please, if you're going to purchase a product, go through the regulatory, the appropriate regulatory pathways. The reason they were put in place was for patient safety and person safety. So they get checked by a third party uh, lab to make sure what's advertised on the box is the same as what's in there and that there's no pesticides or heavy metals or um, other chemicals that can potentially cause problems. We've had two deaths, I believe, over the course of the last few weeks from this problem with vape pens. It's unclear if it's in the e-cigarettes with nicotine or if it's just in cannabis vapes. We we have we no know. idea. We're still figuring it out. It's really been very quick um, happening just in the and last few weeks. And you're saying one of the assumptions is it's from black market that's possibly where, black market, not sort of a mainstream. That's what approved. they're reporting right that's now. That's the report, but it's that's an unknown. Right. So you got to be unknown. careful with vapes until they know more. That's and right. Then, so I tell people smoke the flower. It's been around for hundreds and hundreds and thousands yeah. of years. It worked Just for Bob Marley. Right. It worked for you. That's right. So <laughs> that that's kind of where we should like. So first time user, that's what I tell people. If you're going to use for the first time, just smoke it. Yeah. Um, women, please purchase your own. It's legal now. They have lovely stores. You don't have to be afraid of it. Go men, in and buy men, your men. own. There's yeah. a million of them. There's a million of them. There's a million. Oh. There's Where? Cookies? Cookies? There's cookies a bunch. on Melrose? West Hollywood just had like seven new licenses approved and they're yeah, coming out. Yeah, I see them everywhere. Wildfire. And oh, when yeah. you see the green crosses, is that? The green cross used to be like the way you'd get like the indication that's where yeah. it was. But now it's like Doesn't matter. anywhere and anything. Yeah. They're Got trying it. to make it pretty. So now it's Rodeo Drive Pot yep. Shop. That's right. That's pretty much it. I'm, we're going after yeah. lunch. Now. Yeah. It, great real estate, by the way, because they're great. Oh, my God, um, is it good for real estate? Great for real estate. So They buy I, up a ton of property, at, and they are good with rent. five times market rate. That's so right. I have clients, friends that own industrial warehouses uh -huh. in areas that they've not been able to rent. And some t industrial's gotten hot over the last... 10 years for creative office and other things. But for the most part, a lot of these underutilized warehouse yep. spaces have now been rented out at Rodeo Drive rates, but you're in the middle of San of Bernardino, nowhere. nowhere. So these real estate owners that have been sitting on sort of useless storage space have now created massive income. Yep, they are um, so happy. <laughs> obviously, one of the challenges, and this is another podcast, but one of the challenges is these legal pop businesses are still not banking. They have no That's bank right. services, which is just terrible for everybody. So that is a whole nother podcast, figuring right. out 
the solution and creating banking and taxing and this and that. That's nuts that that isn't in place, but it isn't. Right. So let's get off this topic and talk more about you. I know you have a lot of a lot of advisory boards you sit on and run. I know you speak at events. You're well respected in the community. You're an expert of experts. Can you tell us what's coming up for you and other things that you, you can share with us? Yeah, thank you for that. So, um, so in terms of cannabis education, we are severely lacking, as you can tell, because I'm sitting in a great room with a lot of different people and a lot of different ages and backgrounds, and and you know we all have very little knowledge about this. And so the problem becomes education. And one is on the individual patient level, and one is on the healthcare level. And the healthcare level is actually even worse because at least there's money to be made for the individual and health benefits that people are kind of reading and researching on their own. What's happening on the medical level is that people are just kind of still turning a blind eye. Um, and they kind of do this. They shrug their shoulders up and say, all right, fine, you can use it, but I don't really know anything about it. I mean, that's the most common thing I see my colleagues doing and what I was doing up until just a few years ago. That's what ago. doctors are doing. That's what they do. And it's because, remember, that's we sad. don't get any medical education on this because up until recently, and still now, it's a Schedule One drug according to you know, the DEA, which means that it's on par for medical use as heroin. And cocaine. Come on, I mean, but that's I'll tell you, it's I just, even know more about heroin and cocaine than I did about cannabis before I started this work. Because guess what? Heroin and cocaine still have, not heroin, but heroin comes from opiates, right? And we still have a lot of medical indications for opiates. And so we get all of the background to that. Cocaine, I can get cocaine in the hospital to use for uh, bloody noses. So in, in, you know, severe situations, that's, that they used to put it on cocoa. So there's still like, you know, we talk about things like there's zero indication, there's no no use for things, but it's knowing when it's appropriate, knowing what, yeah. you know, yeah, that is a once in um, a million people time indication. But then like, why don't we know more about this? So we don't get taught about this in medical school. We don't get taught about it in internship, in residency, in fellowship. There is no formal medical education textbooks on this, which we are working now to remedy. So I'm working on a chapter on all the foundational work of cannabis yeah. and the medical indications. And up until now, we've only had two FDA and DEA regulated drugs. Sorry, I'm going off topic. No, this is important. So, so all of this means that your physician, your PA, your NP, your pharmacist, pharmacist your acupuncturist, your um, massage therapist, your physical therapist, all of these people who all help provide a valuable and critical role in your health don't know anything about this. And so the problem became, and it became very apparent to me as I started lecturing on this topic kind of routinely over the past few years, that people were just in, you know, you could tell them cannabis was akin to oregano and they would believe you. I mean, like it was just like there was no yes. understanding. And then when you start talking about things like the endocannabinoid system, which is our body's regulatory pathway for this, just like our sympathetic system and autonomic system, you know, there's all these systems we know about in our bodies, they don't know anything. And so patients would show up at my office and they'd say, God, I'm so glad I finally found you. How come my doctor doesn't know anything about this? How come when I talk to my physical therapist, they're now selling CBD hemp creams to apply on me, but they don't know how much is in there and they don't know what to tell me about it. Mm -hmm. And so because of this, I have been working really hard with a, a group in an organization with the Relief Institute to put together a medical cannabis conference to discuss the medical indications, the research behind it, where is CBD beneficial, where is THC beneficial, what are the routes and modalities of use, where is the legalities of use, you know, where does the TSA stand on this, where can we advise our patients, can they take their medication with them, even if they have a medical recommendation card, or can they not, you know, or what are they expected to do when they go on vacation, or they go, you know, across state lines to visit their daughter in college, what are they supposed to do? And so it's being able to advise patients on that level of detail that is missing. And that's what the conference on October 5th is designed for so that you can get educated from a healthcare perspective so you can then pass on that information to your patients. And I always tell people, I go, this is a practice builder for clinicians and for um, anybody in the healthcare industry because you will be one of the very few people that will be able to provide that amount of knowledge and that level of knowledge to your patients. 
Um, and then like the most exciting part about all of this is the Medical Board of California is actually not just going to be in attendance, but they're going to be giving a half hour lecture about their standpoint on medical cannabis use. So, so, and that's the first time in ever that they're speaking out about this. So this is October 5th. October 5th. It's called the Relief. The Relief Institute presents Understanding Cannabis 2019. And it's real. And R-E-L-E-A-F, like the leaf on a tree, yeah. not your normal spelling of relief. Thought. Thank you for pointing yeah, that just out. Me. I want people to know. So October 5th, what time and where? It's a, a morning uh, conference. So it's from 8 o'clock is registration. And the conference goes until 1230. Um, it will be two physicians that will be lecturing, a lawyer and the Medical Board of California. Um, we are going to have some other really exciting people in attendance at the, at the conference itself. So, um, And everything is geared towards a medical perspective. And so, again, it will not be a wow. recreational talk. Um, and it's going to be here in Los Angeles at the Intercontinental Hotel in Century City. Um, you can get access to it on the website, www.thereliefreleafinstitute.com. The, the Relief, the relief T -H okay. The Relief Institute. And anyone could go, or do you have to be a doctor? No, nope, anyone can come. Public and can go, you buy a ticket, and you can go. Buy a ticket, and you can go. And it, we are um, also offering web webinar access. So if you want to stay in your pajamas at home, which is the way I usually like to yeah. listen to lectures, um, with a nice cup of coffee and my kids screaming in the background, um, you can also attend by webinar on um and it's a it's a discounted price with okay. the webinar. And are is something like this on this level been done, or is this a newer so situation? So there was kind of an attempt to do something like this, but it it's more profitable to pander to the industry of cannabis because yeah. it's a multi billion dollar yeah, industry. Yeah. And so it went from being a very medical conference to becoming a very industry conference and that's where i see 90 percent of these conferences is people from the industry giving lectures and talking about uh, touting their own benefits like oh use my hemp cbd product yeah, yeah. it's great it's a for sales convention. right it's a sales Not convention a educational that's right. platform and to kind of to to cinch the fact that this is a medical education conference we are now offering three continuing medical education or cme credits that has been approved through Providence St. John's Hospital, which is the hospital that I'm affiliated with. And they have gone through excruciating detail together to make sure that this stands up to every level of education that we right want to have in the, in the community. Thank God you're doing it. It almost seems it's irresponsible and almost criminal that FDA and government haven't got together and said enough's enough and we can live in the gray a little bit right. and let's make these changes. I mean, you're talking about right. Children and human beings right. and people in pain and people that are sick. And I mean, right. as a parent, you want every tool you can to help your children. Wouldn't everyone want that? Right. And that's so what and are that's we talking where about? A lot of these it's rules nuts. start changing once the regular, you know, people in legislature and people on public policy have a sick kid or a sick spouse or a sick, you know, right. partner. When it, that's where we're seeing the changes right. happen. When it touches home, someone in power goes, oh, wow, well, really? Yeah. I, this is this is." And the problem becomes it's not just about the medication anymore. It's about knowing how to use it. Because I sure, tell people the complex, same thing. Like it is, it's not just like THC and CBD anymore. It's ratios. It's oils. It's edibles. People are surprised when they hear like a chocolate bar of THC contains one month's worth of medication. So don't take one chocolate bar in one sitting. I mean, it's... Right, exactly. You will call the paramedics and you will land yourself in the ER or you will be asleep for two days, one or the other. Like, yeah. right. So, but it's, but at the same time, people are like, well, why do they make it with so much? And I'm like, it's not so much. If you're sick and you need a month of medication, you don't want to go back to the dispensary every three days because you have to pick up another yeah. prescription or another medication. Yeah. You don't want to have to stockpile that at home because you have kids running around and you don't want to have chocolate bars lying around that they yeah. can get into. So it's, it's talking about, all of those layers and yeah. all of those details that we kind of put the cart in front of the horse. Right. Well, you are doing incredibly important work. Thank you. And I just hope that it grows and expands so people can tune in and really wake up to all the benefits because it, it's really disconcerting to know yeah. in this day and age that people aren't educated and people like you have a voice and have credibility in the medical field to spread the word. And I hope you continue doing what you're doing. Um, anything else, any other groups and websites that people can go to so, to find more about you or more find out about this topic, 
Yeah, so you can also look up my own website, which is Sherry Yafai, M-D, Sherry, S-H-E-R-R-Y, Yafai, Y-A-F-A-I, M-D, um, dot com, and you can take a look at all the things I'm doing, um, thereliefinstitute.com, and um, you can always, people are always asking, well, where can I find a cannabis physician or somebody who's well-versed on this, like you are, in my local area, because all these different states have different rules and we can't keep up with everything. Yeah. Um, you can look at cannabisclinicians.org. So that's a nonprofit medical education group that I sit on okay. the board of. Um, I'm the co-vice president of this organization. It's called the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. And this group has been around for 20 some odd, or I think we celebrated our 20th anniversary this year. And the whole format and goal to this is so that we can provide people, especially healthcare providers with education so that they can take it back to their communities. I hope so. So one other thought that I had, I didn't ask, are you saying, so if I, I'm a young kid and I graduate and I apply for medical school and I go to some distinguished UCLA, Cal, Harvard medical school, I start, I'm starting next year. That, that person is not going to get any curriculum, any education on medicinal uses of cannabis, any scientific education, nope. none. So they can look it up on their own. They on can do their own. Med, so, but they that's can not do... part of medical school curriculum. But that's right. Is it, is it being not. advocated for or is it just an, such a big hurdle it that is. we're not close to that yet? The problem is, is we're seeing things like CBD University pop up everywhere, kind of knickknacks like this. And what we are seeing is um, so some of the medical textbooks like Lipnicott, for example, um, or LWW, uh, blanking on their their full name, they're now hiring physicians like myself and Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, who's a pediatric specialist in cannabis here in Torrance. Um, they're hiring us to basically write a chapter so that we can start opening up those discussions Good. and education pathways. Well, hopefully that moves quickly. I, I yeah. mean, it seems that so much noise is around the business side of legalization and what we were talking, the pot shops everywhere, right. that the medicinal use and the benefit use is getting lost. It's getting lost and it's it's the most important aspect of this. And right, it's just not the money maker for them. So, the, you know, when you can make Sure, like anything. Money, right, exactly. Money, so yeah. it's the money that talks. And what they're missing out is, is that, you know, healthcare has always been kind of a nonprofit ish. I mean, that's a whole lot of bullshit to me, but it's, yeah. it's always been a pseudo nonprofit right. kind of perspective. And so the problem becomes if you can't turn a buck on it, let's, um, not, spend time. let's not spend time on it. Yeah. Meanwhile, our healthcare system is in right. shambles and people's health are in shambles. Right. And, and then and then the other problem becomes that, you know, because it's federally regulated, I mean, I will give people credit where credit is due, because of the federal regulations where people do want to do research, it's being really held back because they can't get a hold or access or use what's what you can walk out on the street in California and just buy because you have a driver's license. You can't do research on that to a certain level because it's federally illegal. So that's where I, I it boggles my mind all the time yeah. because I'm like, so I can buy this easier than I can buy Tylenol now, but I can't do research on this because, right, that's that's exactly right. And no so one that's what to we get... all need to change and you're leading the charge. <laughs> See, hopefully. Well, thank you for giving us all an education. It was yeah. amazing. I'm so happy to finally get you here. I know we've been talking about doing this. Thank and you. We got you in here. Yeah, okay. maybe, we'll have, so maybe we'll have some guests October 5th. All right. Hopefully we'll see you guys. Intercontinental Century City. And I'm, hopefully we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Say hi to your handsome husband. We'll do. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Coming. Thanks, everybody, for having me today. Thank you. That was awesome. Cause I did it my way, nothing y'all can say In this life for the next now that was incredible. Thank you, Dr. Sherry. Sherry Afai, the Relief Institute. Reminder, October 5th, 2019 coming up. She's doing an educational conference on medical cannabis. Anyone could go. It's going to be at the Intercontinental Hotel in Century City, 2151 Avenue of the Stars. It's $2.99 to show up in person. Breakfast is included. There's also a webinar for $150. You could always reach Sherry at the Relief 
Institute, T-H-E-R-E-L-E-A-F, institute.com. She's really, really pushing this medicinal cannabis through and really educating the medical industry in a legitimate way to try to help as many people as possible. So thank you so much. And uh, we're so happy we had her today. Talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.